When you turn on the faucet in your house, you really don't want to think twice about the quality of the water coming out. But that's the reality for millions of people across the South, many of them living in majority Black cities like Jackson, Mississippi and Memphis, Tennessee. Nearly 200,000 residents in Jackson are facing a potential crisis. As Jackson works to restore usable water to its residents, many are wondering, could something like what's happening there also occur in Memphis, a city that often struggles with its aging infrastructure? In our home state of North Carolina, we live with contaminants known as forever chemicals in our water supply, especially along the Cape Fear River in the southeastern part of the state. Camores is responsible for discharging toxic chemicals known as PFAS into the Cape Fear River. But the problems vary across the region. I'm Anissa Khalifa, and this week on The Broadside, producer Charlie Shelton Orman taps into the water across multiple southern cities and learns what it'll take to clean it up. Earlier this year, environmental reporter Adam Mahoney was traveling in the South, digging more into his family's roots. Particularly Texas and Louisiana to, to see the places where my father was born and grew up and as well as my grandmother. As he was trekking across these states, he noticed a startling similarity. The through line that we, we saw was a water crisis, right? And we know that the infrastructure and the finances are just not there typically to support the day-to-day -day needs of people. So Adam decided to look even deeper. He's the national climate and environmental reporter for Capital B News. We're a first of our kind newsroom, um, a, a nonprofit newsroom with an all black staff that reports on black communities across the country. He recently reported on six Southern cities and the serious problem facing their water supply and how black Americans in these areas are bearing the weight of the crisis. What we've seen is, is despite, you know, billions of dollars the most ever made available to revitalize our nation's drinking water infrastructure, um, poor and black communities are probably gonna be the last to reap the benefits. And that's because of one, you know, we have decades, if not centuries of, of racist policies that have kind of led to divestment in these places. But even outside of the, the physical infrastructure, these communities don't have the, the, the job infrastructure, the political infrastructure, one, to build out infrastructure and, and two, to even apply for the funding in the first place. The Biden administration has designated roughly $50 billion to fixing problems with water supplies across the country. That includes improving outdated water systems and better regulation. But is this price tag going to be enough to do the job? Ironically enough, a 2018 federal report that the Environmental Protection Agency found that to maintain and improve our drinking water infrastructure nationwide, that would actually be closer to a $500 billion bill. So mm, well. really the money that's been made available is just a drop in the bucket. It is the, the highest amount of money ever relegated to um, revitalizing our water infrastructure system. But at the end of the day, even if it is the largest sum of money, it's still not enough. And for folks on the ground hearing the grand rhetoric around it doesn't matter too much if you're still going to be drinking brown water. Last month's unprecedented flooding in Mississippi took out a water plant and left the town of Jackson with no running water for weeks. In Jackson, Mississippi, school drop-off isn't just for the kids. It's also for the water. The entire city is facing a boil water notice again. Tonight, we go to Jackson, Mississippi, where residents are still in a fight for clean water. A recent wave of federal funding came with a promise that help would be on the way, but it may take years to see real progress. In the meantime, the city's- Let's start with Jackson, Mississippi. It's a place that's made headlines in recent years for its water crisis. Can you tell us more about the situation in Jackson? Yeah, Jackson, I mean, definitely over the last year and a half has really been the flashpoint for our country's water crisis, particularly because it is, you know, a majority black city, an 80 percent black city. It's brought to the forefront a lot of the racial undertones of our infrastructure system and the way that communities that are typically whiter and wealthier um, have been granted resources over the last several decades to maintain the vital infrastructure that allows folks to thrive in their communities while places like Jackson has it. We have seen under the Biden administration that, you know, there's been different federal initiatives to try to bring Jackson's system up to code, 
last year, at the end of last year, the federal government actually took over the water infrastructure system um, and, and appointed a federal head to lead the improvements being made to the water plants and to the distribution lines. Even after that happened, Jackson still experienced another major water boil notice and a major water shutoffs. It's a tough and difficult situation because when we're thinking about infrastructure and building out things, those are processes that takes months, if not years. Um, and in the meantime, folks are once again left, you know, without water or left with brown water that they cannot consume. Mm. You also found that there are big differences in water supply problems in urban areas compared to rural areas. For example, Jackson is the capital of Mississippi and is dealing with old infrastructure. It's part of the problem. But that infrastructure might not even exist in rural areas dealing with a water crisis. Can you tell us more about the biggest separations between the water crisis happening in these areas in more urban city communities versus outside of the cityscape? Yeah. I, I mean, I think the differences between the crisis in rural communities and urban communities really gets to the fact that there is no one size fits all approach to solving this crisis nationwide and, and kind of pokes holes in the Biden administration's attempts to. Um, mm -hmm. And like you mentioned, in, in urban communities, when we're thinking of, of Jackson, for example, it is a question of outdated infrastructure. So in Jackson, their water plant is over 100 years old um, and they're supposed to be updated you know, every two to three decades. And that has not happened um, in Jackson. But versus in rural communities in Louisiana that we visited, you know, they don't even have water lines connecting you to a, a municipal water plant. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really up to the residents to ensure that they, you know, they have their own water well, um, which is an expensive price tag every year. And, and that also forces them to be the ones that are doing the kind of testing and maintenance um, that you would readily expect a municipality to be doing. Let's talk a little bit more about the responsibilities of those local municipalities. We talked about funds coming from the federal government. What about on more of a local level? How responsible are local municipalities for fixing the issues in their respective cities? Yeah, I mean, over the last 50 some odd years, the bulk share of responsibility for maintaining water infrastructure has actually been placed on local municipalities. Mm. Um, prior to the mid 1970s, the federal government was responsible for, for more than half of that spending. But since then, federal spending on water infrastructure has declined by something like 85 percent, putting that burden on local communities. Uh, we have seen that, you know, there are policies that allow communities and cities to apply for federal funding, but that's not an easy process and requires you to have, you know, the staff to be able to sit and do a grant application and then wait on a grant application for months at a time, which does not exist in, in many small cities. So then it's just left these communities that are already cash strapped for other reasons to kind of do piecemeal fixes, band-aid fixes. And then as we see in, in a place like Jackson, it, it comes to a head one day um, and your, your community is left without water for weeks at a time. Coming up, we'll jump across state lines and look at what happens when the water bill comes and isn't paid. I'm Anita Rao, host of the weekly podcast, Embodied. It's a show that no matter the topic dives into unexpected territory, like what it's like to first get an autism diagnosis as an adult, or how BDSM communities may change the way you think about kink. You'll meet folks who aren't afraid to question what we think we know about intimacy and who have some fascinating stories to share about their relationships. Listen to Embodied and let's take on the taboo together. Adam, let's cross over. Let's go from Jackson, Mississippi to Louisiana and Opelousas. Um, let's talk again about municipalities and what they're looking to to try to put uh, a Band-Aid over these problems. Let's talk about this revenue stream based on scooping up funds by closing overdue accounts. What's going on with that? Opelousas, Louisiana is a semi-rural town about an hour outside of Lafayette, only home to, to 15,000 residents. But it's also the second or third poorest city in Louisiana mm -hmm. um, and facing a lot of different issues when we're thinking about like 
gun violence and lack of educational opportunities. But when, when we do think of a community that is struggling with poverty, we know folks, they don't have savings, they don't have extra cash and are strapped and making hard decisions every month on what they can pay for and, and what they can't. And what we we saw in, in Opelousas over the last couple of years um, through information released through Louisiana's Public Information Act is that actually the city has been enforcing a, a pretty predatory practice of closing water accounts that are overdue by just two weeks at a time. So if you're holding funds, you know, you get paid at the end of the month, you can't pay your bill until then. And you, you try to wait three weeks to pay your bill, your account's going to get shut off. And then you have to pay on top of the fees that you already owe, you have to pay to get it turned back on. And we saw that a city of 15,000 people, they've done that um, practice something like 14,000 times in the last three years. So that really could mean everyone in the city at one point um, had their water turned off in a three or four year period. And then they're recouping you know, funds two to three times as much as the bills were actually worth just so they can fund their water system hmm. because they don't have that federal backing anymore. And for some people, for some customers, that can be a cyclical thing where their water is turned off multiple times, correct? Exactly. Yeah. And you're getting pushed further and further in debt all while, you know, you might put that $150 back in to get your water turned back on and then it's still going to be brown water coming out of your faucet. So it's a kind of a lose-lose situation for folks. And it's one thing to be concerned about your personal health, your family's health, if you see, you know, brown water coming out of your faucet and understandably not wanting to drink it. But not having access to clean water also has other effects out of just, you know, your personal health and personal well-being. It trickles into socio-cultural and economical ripple effects into communities. Can you tell me more about what you heard from folks in Opelousas specifically about those ripple effects? In Opelousas, which I mentioned earlier, is, is one of the poorest cities in Louisiana. Um, it also has the highest rate of violent crime um, and second highest rate of gun violence. And in talking to residents, um, both young and old and, and community organizers, uh, a lot of folks made the connections between that lack of water access um, and that lack of air from from government entities to the way that people on the ground relate to each other and the high rate of, of communal violence. There's been multiple studies that have shown that water contamination impacts your mood and your decision making, but increasingly urban planners and environmental activists have actually pointed to this theory called cues to care. Um, so it just explains that if there is visible maintenance and, and care and investment to your community um, from the powers to be, you know, social cohesion and, you know, better communal relationships follow. But if you don't have those things, there is that disruption. Organizers and, and residents have seen it firsthand in Opelousas. So finally, let's talk about Memphis, Tennessee. In Memphis, our water is our source of pride. Some of the best in the world. It's a city that you point out relies heavily on groundwater supply. But the problem is that groundwater supply is starting to get contaminated. Tonight we're investigating areas where it's easier for toxic chemicals to leach into that ground and contaminate our precious water supply. Can you tell us more about what you learned about the situation in Memphis and what's happening to their groundwater supply? Yeah, Memphis is a, another unique situation as a, another majority black city. At one point, it was the largest city in the United States to 100% rely on its groundwater, which is typically a cleaner water source and doesn't require as much water treatment. And at one point, was it was considered the cleanest and sweetest water in the country. But what we've seen over the last couple of decades is that a product of climate change and fluctuating groundwater levels, in addition to industrial contamination, has really threatened that water source. One of the top 10 most contaminated sites in the United States is actually located in Memphis, a former coal plant that was recently shuttered that for decades was actually allowing coal ash, which is the byproduct of, of burning off coal, to seep into the soil. And then as that ash seeped into the soil, it then seeped into the groundwater, which impacts now hundreds of thousands of people's drinking water sources. Uh, but it's it's interesting 
because this is a new issue, um, it's not something that folks in the city really think about often um, because you've grown up being told that you have the cleanest water in the country. Um, why now would you, you know, question that? Um, and there's a, a big issue around getting that message out to folks. And I think that also points to, you know, the different ways that industrial companies can pollute. Um, when we're thinking about like Louisiana, which has the country's highest concentration of petrochemical plants, fossil fuel plants, folks there know that industry has tainted their water because they see it every day. They, you know, a lot of people work at these plants. I was a plant worker at one time. Okay. We put up a plant off of Old Town Road over here mm -hmm. and we dug a, a big old hole. Mm -hmm. I interviewed one man in Louisiana who actually, unbeknownst to him, had helped create a, a fill pipe into his water source where his, the chemical plant he worked at dumped directly into the waterway there. Wow. I thought we was cutting the channel so we could bring a boat in because we were on the river putting the drainage pipe in there. We were dumping the water in. Versus in Memphis, when we're thinking about groundwater, something that's invisible, that's you know something you're not gonna think about every day because it's not in front of you. One of the folks who you spoke with that really stood out to me was Herbert Rigmaiden, who lives in Lake Charles. And he put it pretty bluntly and powerfully, the impact of this issue. Can you tell us more about what he told you? Yes. Yeah, so Mr. Rigmaiden, well into his 80s, has lived on the same plot of land outside of Lake Charles, Louisiana for his whole life. And, you know, he's seen directly the increased expansion of, of chemical plants around him and has seen how it's impacted his lifestyle. Um, as a young man, he watched his mother die of cancer. He now takes care of his younger brother who has Parkinson's disease, which has been recently linked to a specific chemical that is produced at natural gas plants. Um, in addition, you know, he's seen cancer ravage his livestock and his, and his livelihood. All while that has been going on, he has seen the Environmental Protection Agency come into his neighborhood and to his community They've done tests, um, they've held meetings, and they've, you know, proudly boasted multiple times that the water and the air is clean and safe to consume. But at the end of the day, he said they drink the water and they end up with cancer. Mm. Adam, what do you hope to see next with these repair efforts, both nationally and more locally? Yeah, that's that's a big question and something that we've we've been thinking about and grappling with and you know just talking to community members, activists and environmental organizations. You know, there is a understanding that at sometimes at the federal level, you know, your hands are tied in in terms of the money that's going to trickle down to your community. But folks are calling for is like a, a direct line, direct communication because the people on the ground are the folks that really hold the solutions and answers to the crises that, you know, impact them every day because they're the ones that have to live through it um, rather than someone coming in and telling you how to fix your neighborhood, how to build out this infrastructure. There are people in these communities that, that know what they're doing um, and know what they want to see. Adam, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to me about this. For sure. After Adam and I talked, the city of Opelousas in Louisiana announced that it has secured a $27 million loan for a new water plant, another step out of several toward safe drinking water. You can check out Adam Mahoney's reporting on the South's water crisis at Capital B. We've dropped a link in this week's show description. This episode of The Broadside was produced by Charlie Shelton Ormond. Our editor is Jared Walker. The Broadside is a production of North Carolina Public Radio, WUNC. Find us on your favorite podcast app and on WUNC.org. If you enjoyed the show, leave us a rating, a review, or tell a friend to tell a friend. I'm Anissa Khalifa. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll be back next week.